And some of those are listed over here now. So this is a list now. I'm going to show you the biomarker. So the, the biomarkers that we came up with were combinations of genes. So it turned out that single proteins, single genes, like just this one, which is this is the designation, des, excuse me, the scientific designation is ASIC, ASIC, which means acid sensing ion channel. This is a, a receptor that detects uh, pH. So if, you're, if your blood becomes acid, it, it, it can detect that. But it turns out it doesn't work by itself. All by itself, it doesn't do much of anything. It requires one of these two receptors. This is a P2X, this is a P2X5. These two different receptors actually respond to ATP of all things. ATP is energy of life. You may have all heard about that. But it takes one of these in combination with this to actually produce a signal. If you only have this, you wouldn't signal until you were dead because your pH would have to be so low that you would be dead. <laughs> so, but with these two, this becomes more sensitive. So it required those together. Also required this receptor, TRIP-V1. So TRIP-V1 is actually the receptor for chili peppers. It's the one that makes chili peppers taste hot. It's the essence of hot. What it does in the body, though, the TRIP-V1 receptor detects heat it detects how warm your, your, the, the world is around you. And one of the things that it does is it contributes to your thermal set point. So your body core temperature is partly set by this gene because it detects how warm your body is. Okay, But it also contributes to the activation of this complex so that when your muscle is producing chemicals, when you're exercising it, it, it reacts both to the heat, because your muscle also gets warmer, and to some of the chemicals that are produced to enhance the activity of, of this particular signaling agent again. And because of that, this combination can signal muscle pain, but it also can signal muscle fatigue. We think something similar is going on in the brain, and the brain uses a slightly different mix of these receptors, but we really haven't studied that. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that that's the case. So, and what this is signaling then, is signaling muscle pain and muscle fatigue, and you need to think about this. So, this is a different defini definition of fatigue, and this is a sensory phenomenon of fatigue. So this is that feeling that when you start upstairs, your leg, legs are getting tired. This is the feeling from your brain that I can't concentrate anymore. I have to shift my attention to something else. It's not the, uh, uh, the sudden collapse of your brain where you're just going conscious. It's not that at all. It's this overwhelming desire to shift the focus, to not try to concentrate on what you're concentrating on. So that's the, the phenomenon that, that we're calling fatigue in this case. However, fatigue also means that you can't contract your muscles anymore. So meaning that if I work hard enough, eventually I, the muscles fail and I can't contract your muscle. It turns out that's what exercise physiologists have been studying for many, many years. Is that related to that sensory phenomenon, the fact that I feel tired? Yes, it is related, but it's not the same thing. They're two different uh, phenomena, but they are mediated partly by the same sensory receptors. There's just a lot of different rules that go on and exactly how that happens. I've got a colleague who's studying that right now, trying to study exactly the other phenomena why you stop contracting your muscles. And so he's interested in the same sensory neurons we are, but in a very different way. Okay, so let's go on down the list here. So these down here are adrenergic receptors. Uh, these all control uh, the, uh, the amount of vasodilation you have. So they, they are receptors that are on your blood vessels and can cause your blood vessels to dilate so they can get more wide open, so more blood can go through, or they can constrict, which will keep blood from going to the area that's, that's constricted, but will then divert the flow to other parts of your body. So these receptors can do that. Um, that's the reason we included them. Uh, also, the other reason to include them is that these receptors that are down in your muscle, the ones that signal fatigue, they also signal your sympathetic nervous system to contract your blood vessels or to dilate your blood vessels, depending on if you're a working muscle or not. So in fact, these receptors are signaling the system that affects these receptors. And then later on, just as chance would have it, uh, although it makes some sense too, we discovered that these receptors were also found in sensory neurons. So your sensory neurons were responding to the same messages that were causing your blood vessels to dilate too. And that got really complicated. So the, the system is clearly circular. So the, the, this system affects this one, 
affecting this affects these. So it's, it gets, gets very complicated. These down here are all receptors and uh, cytokine genes. These are your immune system genes down here. Okay, so that's just to sort of give you the players in, in the field here. This, these are controls looking at all of these genes during, uh, uh, excuse me, after, 30 minutes after, 8 hours, 24, and 48 hours after that exercise. So this is before the exercise. You can't even see them because I've normalized them to one. So they're all one. Here you can see the colors a little bit if you're really up close. <laughs> the colors are there, but they're not changing. And I did that, we actually adjusted them to make them the same. Following the exercise and controls, some of them go down, some of them go up. Eight hours later, some of them are up. 24 hours some, uh, later, some of them are up. At 40 hours, most of them are back down. Some of them are still up here a little bit. Um, none of these differences you see here are significantly different from baseline except for this one right here, the beta one. And exactly why that is, I don't know. Uh, but we have some ideas of why that might be. So these are controls. The next thing I want to show you is what goes on in chronic fatigue patients that also have fibromyalgia syndrome. And this is what happens to them 30 minutes after exercise. So you can compare the two. This is a log scale. So at a log scale, that means that changes that occur here are way, way bigger than changes that occur here. So this, in fact, would be here and so on. So th th basically, these would be somewhere up in here if, uh, if it wasn't on a log scale. <laughs> so, so just to, and I did that so that everything would fit on the page here, because otherwise it wouldn't. So you can see that these genes are, are increased following the exercise, and these are increased, and these are increased too. So there's an increase in a lot of these. Okay, next, eight hours later, again, they're up even more, except there's a few differences in there. Uh, 24 hours up, 40 hours still up. Okay, so you can see that uh, this is the phenomenon that you're looking at here fits very, very well with the fatigue and pain that I showed you that the patients reported. This looks like an envelope of exactly what was going on with them. Okay. Down here then is what happens to patients that have chronic fatigue syndrome that do not have uh, fibromyalgia syndrome. This group down here. Uh, excuse me, I got that backward. This is chronic fatigue only. <laughs> Sorry about that. These people do not have comorbid uh, fibromyalgia. I should have known that when I looked at this. And that's just this particular gene. Uh, in patients that have both chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, you can see in a minute, it's not going to matter which one I talked about, other than that one gene. <laughs> this is the only gene that's different, really. And this one right here. These two genes are different than, than I'm going to show you. Here's the rest of it. The rest of the picture is this. And as you see, it's pretty much the same in, in both of these groups. So for that reason, we're beginning to think that, yes, there can be, they can be different because these two genes right here, which are these, this gene, trp one and ASIC3, because those genes are different, there can be a, a slight difference in the syndrome. But basically, this is a, actually a fairly homogeneous group. Okay? What's not homogeneous is what I'm going to show you next. So all these say without AE2A decreased patients, without AE2A decreased patients. And I'm showing you that because what we discovered was that there truly is a major subgroup here. And it's 39% of all the chronic fatigue syndrome patients that we examine here. It's almost 40% of the patients. And this is what it looks like. In fact, the genes that go up here uh, at all times here, none of these are significantly different from, from, from the controls except this beta 1. The real difference is between this and controls, and I'll show you controls again in a minute. I'm going to put them up the top here in a minute, is th this gene right here. That gene is the alpha 2A receptor. The alpha-2A receptor is one of the major receptors on your blood vessels and, and all over the place that actually causes vasoconstriction. It's what keeps your blood pressure high when you begin to stand up. So if you're sitting down and you suddenly stand up, this gene activates, constricts your blood vessels, sh shunts blood to your brain so you don't pass out. Okay? So it's responsible, that gene is responsible for, the, for preventing what we call orthostatic intolerance, the inability to suddenly stand upright or to come upright sometimes at all, period. And we found that, in this case, 40% of all the CFS-only patients had this gene going down, and 38% of all the chronic fatigue patients with fibromyalgia had this gene going down as well. And you see here that that's the only thing that's really going on here because here's the controls up here. 
So this is a very, very different patient group. And it's, it's, it's characterized by the fact, let's see if I have it here, oh, wrong way. Okay, it's characterized by the fact that these patients, 70% of the patients that show this gene expression pattern with, with the, the, the adrenergic uh, alpha uh, 2A receptor that goes down, decreases with extra, after exercise, 70% of those people have orthostatic intolerance. And only about 20% or less than 20% of the, of the other group have orthostatic intolerance. And we think, in that case, some of that is just we don't we don't know we haven't got the mix right here to know exactly how to look at it because they, they may be the same same patients here. Or orthostatic intolerance is actually difficult to measure, so it has to be measured at the right time. So it could be that it's just simply that the clinical measurement of the orthostatic intolerance was incorrect. Yes. Um. Would medication affect the gene expression? I was on yes. the study, and yep. I take lead over for it. Yep, yep. So medication can actually affect it. And I'm going to get to that maybe toward the end. It, it, the way it affects it is that the medications that Cindy actually found, we found out, she actually told us about this. She actually gave us one patient. She said, I can't figure out what's going on with this patient. There's something. It's a young patient. He's, he's really orthostatic and talent. What's really going on? And I looked at the, his gene expression, and, and she said, you've got you know, all the other symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome. And I looked at it, and the first thing I saw, because I wasn't looking at it on a log scale, and I said, there's nothing wrong with this guy. He looks just like a control. And then I looked and saw that all the way along, this particular gene was missing. It was just plain blank. Because uh, I, I wasn't looking at it on a log scale, there was just a gap there. And then I, I put it on a log scale, and then I could see that fact it was decreasing very, very dramatically. Because if you don't put it on a log scale, you can't see the decreases very effectively with this. So, and when I re recognized that, I said, gee, how many more of these are there? <laughs> so I went back to all of the ones we'd looked at and found, yeah, in fact, there was a large percentage of them in, in each of these cases, a large percentage of these people, and that they, they if you put them all together, this is all of them together, it's, it's a lot of patients, um, they all show this same phenomenon. And then we, that's when we discovered and went back and said, wow, these people are or orthostatic intolerant. What do the drugs do for these patients? Actually, very little. So the drugs that, that are typically given, and Cindy has figured out, that this particular group works uh, 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 because of orthostatic intolerance. Minadrin is actually a drug that actually works for them. It causes real bad side effects, but it actually makes them feel better for a short period of time. So it's not the, we know it's not the right treatment, but it is a treatment. <laughs> but a lot of the other drugs that uh, don't work as well on these patients as do on others. For the other patients, uh, some drugs do actually decrease the gene expression. Uh, it doesn't take it all the way down, but it, it knocks it down. And I may show you some of that at the end of the, the, the time here if I can get to it. Okay. All right. So what about patients with only fibromyalgia and not much fatigue? This is a larger group of patients in general, although it's a smaller group on our sample. We only had, it looked at 18 of them. What do they show? Well, this is what they show. Remember the controls? They look like controls. There's almost nothing going on. The gene expression just simply didn't change the patients with fi only fibromyalgia that did not have chronic fatigue syndrome. So we thought, well, gee, that's puzzling. You know, we should be seeing something here. They have muscle pain. We have genes in there that should be encoding muscle pain. So let's look a little more carefully here and see what's going on at baseline. So remember, I adjusted all the baselines to one here. I did show you what the, how the baselines might be different. So the, the, are, the, are the genes different before we exercise? Are they different? Well, in the chronic fatigue patients, the answer is no. If I look at the averages all of all of them, they're very close to the averages of the control. For the fibromyalgia patients, that wasn't true.